Thank you everybody for joining us for the virtual artist talks today by the participating faculty members in the art exhibition titled Persist, Resist, Coexist, Works by Women Faculty in the College of Architecture. The exhibit is currently mounted in the Wright Gallery until October 15th. The Wright Gallery is located in the Langford Architecture Center, Building A, on Texas A&M campus. The gallery is open on weekdays from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. To stay safe during this pandemic, today we gather virtually and we welcome our participating faculty members and viewers from various locations on Zoom and Facebook Live. To celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the United States, this art exhibition features works by 11 women faculty members in the College of Architecture. The centennial celebration occurs in the midst of political and social turmoil in the, in the United States and the ongoing climate, climate change crisis and an unprecedented global pandemic. Reflecting on the urgency of these events and conditions, this exhibition includes works that expand beyond a woman's right to vote. The exhibition highlights the diverse backgrounds and research interests among participating faculty members. It is a multimedia exhibition that brings, to, brings together painting, drawing, sculpture, photography, and interdisciplinary video. Common themes throughout the exhibition include landscape, abstraction, and gender, gender identity. To further our celebration of women, participating faculty members have provided statements about their work, listing women artists and designers who influence them some providing direct quotes of inspiration. We've created a digital catalog which, with these artist statements and educational online links relating to the influential artists and designers, which can be found on our Red Gallery website. Part one of this two-part series of virtual artist talks includes faculty who explore abstraction and landscape in their work in the Red Gallery, including Chris Sankey, Jane Winslow, Karen Hillier, Mary Saslow and Courtney Starrett. Before we begin with our first speaker, I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Rebecca Pugh. I'm the curator at the Wright Gallery and a lecturer in the Department of Visualization. I have three drawings and a sculpture in the exhibition. These works are abstractions of mundane objects from my everyday surroundings when I lived in Florida a beach umbrella, a swimming pool, and a slice of watermelon, and my abstract sculpture of a seashell titled A1A. Here you can see the underlying structure of my sculpture in progress, which is wire with ribbed canvas uh, and paint. Challenging the traditions of painting, I typically like to work large with ribbed canvas and conceptual fabrics, such as secondhand uh, ripped bed sheets on painted wooden freestanding free structures. It becomes difficult to work large as I have lived in four different states over the past five years. I moved to the US from Canada in 2012 and I received my MFA in art at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. My recent works include small sculptures and works on paper using paint and polychromos color pencils. Inspirations for my work include Anne Truitt's painted wooden sculptures, Lee Montague's sculptural paintings, including wire and canvas, Carmen Herrera's geometric abstract paintings, and Agnes Martin's grid paintings with horizontal line. Agnes Martin is also a Canadian artist who lived and worked in the US. After a period of five years of living in the U United States as a non-immigrant spouse without work authorization, I am very happy to be here today at Texas A&M University as a new faculty member. Um, with that being said, I would like to introduce my colleague, Krista Steinke. Thank you, Rebecca, and everyone who is listening in today with us. I am um, an assistant instructional professor in the Department of Visualizations. Um, my background is in studio art with an emphasis in photography, video, and installation. I'm especially interested in working with the photographic medium in unconventional ways. 
And for the past five years or so, I have been focused on a project called Good Luck with the Sun, where the sun serves as my subject, as well as a way to generate imagery using its light and its heat. I'm also exploring the sun's relationship to time and how that reflects back onto personal experience. To help inform this work, I've been looking at celestial maps, images of the solar system, thinking about the time-space continuum, and the different cycles that are found in, in nature. And these themes and references are present in my newest work, which is featured in the Wright Gallery exhibition, which I call Time Scraps from the Universe. Um, for this new series, I'm repurposing old photographic projects to make new works in collage, uh, stop frame animation, and installation. Um, I started this project while last spring while I was in quarantine. And here are some shots of the work in progress, as well as my very, very messy studio space. Um, I'm showing this because I think this work is very much about the creative process, but it also captures how I've been feeling like many in this moment in time, this chaos and this, this craziness that we're going through on both the personal level, but also in regards to the recent social and political events that have taken place over the last few months. And so this idea of chaos versus control is definitely a theme that is present in this work. And the concept of time also resurfaces as well. Time for me lately has felt very warped and distorted. I wake up some days not knowing what day of the week it is. Um, time is also very connected to the coronavirus and how the sickness um, runs its course. Um, on a broader level, I've been thinking about time and the physical body, especially how it relates to the female experience. Um, from monthly cycles to the biological clock, and then of course the later stage of menopause. And then there's themes of life and death. Um, very sadly, a very important figure in my life passed away. So I've been thinking about time in relationship to one's lifetime and time in terms of memory. Back to my messy studio. <laughs> I've also been thinking about time in relationship to my own, the evolution of my own studio practice. And so while in quarantine, I uh, started rummaging through my old sketchbooks and some old notes and old photo projects, which I mentioned is the source material for my collages. But I've also been revisiting some books by artists who have had a very important impact on my career. Um, and recently I took note that most of those artists are women. <laughs> so as a way to kind of create or impose a structure on this new creative direction and working with collage, which is a very new um, approach to art for me, I started this series that I call Thank You Notes, which are small works in a way, sort of an homage or a dedication to some of these artists who've had an influence on my, my art practice. And um, this first thank you note, which is in the show and the exhibition, is dedicated to Eva Hesse. Her, the book that I own of hers is on the left and then my work is on the right. Um, Hesse's work is very much about materials and process and um, her experience as a female artist. Louise Bourgeois is another influence um, and her work also revolves around the female experience. Like me, she suffers, or uh, she did suffer from insomnia, and this became a very important aspect of her work, including her work on the spiral form, um, which for her was a symbol of chaos and control. Um, I share both Ava Hess's and Louise Bourgeois' interest in using abstraction as a way to make the personal feel more universal. Really quickly, um, Nancy Holt is another artist that I have been looking at, especially in reference to my work on the sun and her monumental site-specific project called Sun T Tunnels, which also relates to time and the cycles of the sun. And then finally, um, one of my more recent influences is Helma Off Klimt, um, whose work I saw in a show at the Guggenheim a few years ago. 
And she's an artist who's interested in connecting the spiritual realm with the universe, the greater universe. And in particular, I've been very interested in her um, sketchbook drawings, diagrams, and notebooks. Um, so these collages are very small. They're about 12 by 16 inches. Um, and they're very gestural, spontaneous, sometimes a little bit messy. And I see them as, I, they, for me, they function as sketches or prototypes for potentially larger works that I, I might eventually make. Um, they're not yet posted on my website, but if, if you're interested, um, most of my work or some of my other projects directly reflect some of the themes that I'm talking about in this, this, this newer collage work. All right, thanks for listening and I'm gonna send it back to Rebecca. Thank you, Krista. Our next speaker is going to be Jane Winslow. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Jane Winslow. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Urban Planning here at Texas A&M. I joined the faculty here in the fall of 2018. Uh, after uh, getting a bachelor's degree and master's degree in landscape architecture, I went back to school and got a PhD in community and regional planning with a focus on green infrastructure and health. I come from a, pra a practice background, so I have a lot of experience in built projects throughout the United States. My built projects align with my research interests in multifunctional green infrastructure with the goal of promoting physical activity and ecological sustainability in both design and implementation. I engage reflective practice in my work using photography for both documentation and storytelling. For this exhibit at the Wright Gallery, my photo is titled Reflections of Time Past and Present. I captured this image at the Museum of Arts of the 21st century called the Maxi Museum in Rome. On the same day, unfortunately, that the designer, British Iraqi architect Zaha Hadid died in Miami of a heart attack. It was eerie. I was accompanying a group of design students on a field trip to the museum, and I was struck by the contrast of the modern museum and its reflection of the older buildings nearby. The temporality of visual representation of both despair in her passing and hope for the future. It's a portrayal of multiple meanings with stories embedded in the past and present. I discussed it with my Italian tour guide, a colleague on the trip, and the role of women in design. She pointed out to me that we still have a long way to go. Although women in the United States could vote in 1920, in Italy, women didn't have full voting rights until 1947. The power of storytelling is a recurring theme throughout my work. I've been influenced particularly by two photographers that are women. The first, is Marjorie Marion Post Wolcott, who's known for her Depression Area Farm Service Administration photos. She was noted particularly for her variations in subject matter, a range of people from wealthy to impoverished, all within a local environment context that tells a story. The second one is Anne Spurn a landscape architect, an author, a photographer, and teacher. Her images explore the reading of the landscape to understand its meaning and explain the stories within those photographs. I've enjoyed the influence of both of these women in their pragmatic approach, their imagination, and quest for discovery of the extraordinary in the everyday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Our next speaker is going to be Karen Hillier. Hi, I'm Karen Hillier. I'm a practicing artist. My degrees are in studio art, painting, printmaking, and photography from the University of Texas with a BFA and University of Illinois with a Master of Fine Art in painting and printmaking. When I went to school, to graduate school, to get an MFA, I thought I would be able to have two years of painting before I faced the inevitable career 
if you can call it that, of becoming a waitress at Howard Johnson's. Those of you who are younger, that's sort of an equivalent of Denny's. Much to my surprise, the University of Illinois hired me to teach in an experimental program where, as a studio artist, I was hired to teach uh, architecture students in a studio course. This experimental program really marked the uh, trajectory of my entire uh, career in higher education because at A&M, I entered into the experimental program of environmental design as a prof and then entered into teaching in the Master of Science in Visualization and experience with the new degree program in MFA in Visualization. I'm a founding member of the Department of Visualization and primary author of both degree programs, the Master of Science in Visualization and the MFA in Visualization. Each of these degree programs are characterized as unique and visionary. Currently, along with some of the artists that you see here, I'm a founding member of the Wright Gallery Curatorial Committee and full-time practicing interdisciplinary or multimedia artist. For this exhibition, I'm showing photographs taken with a pinhole camera. That is, there's no lens on the camera. But in this case, this is a stereo pinhole camera. And there are two tiny, tiny, tiny holes one for the left eye view and one for the right eye view. They expose film. This is my stereo camera right here. This is a Chinese camera, a Holga camera. This is the cable release. And here is not a lens, but just the tiniest of holes. You can almost not see it. Left eye and right eye. At the same time, so, so these photographs, uh, they're exposed on film. This is the stereo viewer that merges the two images into a third 3D stereo images. These are the left eye and the right eye views. And you look through this viewer and voila, you have, you pop into a very deep stereo image. In the exhibition, uh, I worked with a fabricator and we designed an exploded stereo viewer in two different scales so that anyone who comes to the show can understand how the stereo image works in mixing of the two images to have uh, a very, very uh, deep 3D view. I photograph in the cotton fields of the Brazos bottom between the little Brazos and the big Brazos rivers. This area was originally known as Mudville, Texas due to the frequent flooding and was considered undesirable land. It's some of the richest uh, bottom land actually in the world. This is a place where I am grounded as I played in these fields as a child with the children of Italian farmers. And in my personal mythology, I always thought not that I was born under a cabbage leaf and given to my parents, but in one of these fields. These are not photographs that capture a still moment to be pressed, impressed upon our memory. Nothing is still here. Everything is constantly changing, constantly in motion. The sun moves, the sky changes and moves, the cotton moves in the wind, I move through the fields, and the plants change literally overnight. There is an experience of layered time when I photograph. I'm aware of geologic time as I drive to the Brazos bottom. There are a series of terraces that have been cut into the land by the Brazos River. I descend these three distinct terraces, ter uh, cuts. Uh, the first is near, by the way, the Riverside campus or the Rellis campus. Walking into the fields, I'm aware of the time of generations of Italians who hand down the land from father to children. 
And finally, I am in the time, the time reference of photography, with each exper exposure taking about 30 seconds. When I walk out into this fertile, familiar landscape, by the way, do you see that little tiny figure on the right-hand side of the road next to the cotton field? That's me photographing. It gives you an idea of the sense of scale of this space. I feel I've been stripped bare, exposed to sun, wind, heat, and lightning. There's no tree cover, no buildings, no place to protect myself. I'm totally present and alert in my vulnerability. Women artists who, have, uh, who are important touchstones are first, in this case, a photographer named Dorothea Lang. And Dorothea Lang was a member of the same group, Farm Security Administration. She was the first woman hired that Jane talked about uh, with Wolcott. And uh, she went by herself out into the culture of people who were migrating from the Midwest to California in search of work. The reason that they were migrating, and these are, this is a family actually walking to California to one of the camps to look for work. They lost everything because of the Great Depression combined with a horrific drought that lasted for a number of years throughout the Midwest. Dorothea Lang went in the 1930s, went into these camps and uh, rubbed elbows with these people. This is called Migrant Mother and is one of her photographs and is the most famous photograph in the world. You've probably seen it. I'm also indebted in a spiritual way to Olivia Parker, who's a living photographer. She uh, deals with very, very big ideas. She has a body of work called Weighing the Planets. She has another body of work called Vanishing in Plain Sight, which is about her husband disappearing in front of her eyes due to uh, Alzheimer's. Her work is, it's important. Her work is this wonderful balance between specific, very specific and mysterious subject matter that she puts together in her studio, but also the work is always constructed with an awareness of the poetry and how articulate light relationships can be. Uh, it's my hope, and when I photograph, I very, very much try to deal with light in the same way. And the fact that I'm photographing landscape is really, in many ways, a second concern. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Karen. Our next speaker is now Mary. Hi, my name is Mary Chani. I have other names, but that's the name I use when I sign my work. I'm not showing you work today except what's in my studio, um, but you can find it at marychani.com, C-I-A-N-I. -I. Um, like most artists, I suppose, I've always been an artist, thanks to the support of two elementary school teachers, Miss Ash and Miss Adams and my parents who each had a sister who was an artist so that was okay i earned two mfas from carnegie mellon and the university of houston and studied art across the country in my 20s new york san francisco ann arbor largely in my own world i came first to texas a m as an artist in residence and stayed on teaching drawing, painting, digital painting, and design studios, lots of design studios. And I recently retired. Always I was doing my own work in studios in Houston and in Bryan and exhibiting. In this exhibit are four large paintings, four feet by three feet, all in the Deluge series. I've done 50 large paintings in the series so far and 50 smaller ones. I started with 300 drawings of mostly benign water, the flood series, a response to Texas droughts. <sighs> but then came melting glaciers, rising seas, 
flooding and larger hurricanes forming over the overheated Gulf and slamming into Texas. I gained a new clarity of understanding. We enjoyed a marvelous petroleum-based civilization for 150 years or so, but now we find that we are killing the host planet. This art is new to me. It's a new subject, a new size, four feet by three instead of four by five, a new vertical format suitable for painting falling water, a new medium, golden brand acrylics, after using oil since the seventh grade, as long as I'm using golden acrylics, I don't miss oil. And a new limited palette of mainly translucent pigments. The red I use is like painting with lipstick. It's a symbol of blood. The dark purple makes a deep, oily petroleum black. Creamy titanium white is for snow and ice melt. And then there's green gold, and other paints, and a blue, the color of our blue world, our blue sky, and our blue water that are under attack. So I paint deluge postcards from the future. I bring to this everything I have learned, taught, know, and discover anew. As for influences by women artists, for the first two decades, there was no one beside my art teachers in elementary school. Um, I went to a woman's college, and I never had a woman faculty member and never noticed, and the textbook book we used had no women artists in it. Then I went to New York City and studied at the uh, Art Students League in the evening after working as a book designer, and um, I was in the studio that accepted me, but it was right next door to one that banned women. And of course, I lived at the Museum of Modern Art and never noticed there were hardly any women in the collection. But then there was a sea change in our culture. I researched and chaired a discussion on women artists at Carnegie Mellon and later studied with my first role model, Minyanette Chang at the University of Michigan. A revelation came to me in many artists when I saw the international exhibition Women Artists 1550-1950 at the University of Texas in 1987. After that, many women became present to me and influenced me with their work and with their courage, including many of the ones already listed by other members of this show. And also Hannah Hoch, Tamara de Lampica, Frida Kahlo, Sue Cole, and artists I've known personally in Houston and College Station. But today, I mentioned Kathy Kolwitz. She said, I felt that I have no right to withdraw from the responsibility of being an advocate. We both respond to the most urgent violence of our time. As she made powerful images opposed to war, poverty, and death, so I am called to an art of warning, a prophecy of the coming end of our petroleum-based civilization. We are both artists. And that's what we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. That was wonderful. Our last speaker today is going to be Courtney. Thank you, Rebecca. And it's tough to go last after all these great talks. Um, so hi, I'm Courtney Sterrett. I'm a mother, an artist, and an educator. I moved to College Station from New York last year to join the faculty of Texas A&M in the Department of Visualization. And this summer I got really excited when I read the call for entries for this exhibition. I had been working on designs to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment for a while. And this exhibi exhibition moved one of the designs to the top of the queue and forced me to follow through and finish it. In her book, Lean In, women, work, and the will to lead, Sheryl Sandberg writes, in the future, there will be no female leaders. There will just be leaders. This statement has resonated with me since I first read this book several years ago. Women and men are just different as all individuals are, all individual human beings have differences. And until the world can accept women leading while remaining their authentic selves, instead of feeling like they need to act like men to be taken seriously, 
we have not achieved true equality. This is the premise for the title of my piece in the show, Equal But Different. I looked at the gender and race of the members of the 116th US Congress to begin the narrative for a set of baskets. I acquired the statistics from Rutgers University's Center for American Women in Politics, but despite this Congress being the most diverse in US history, it's clear from this infographic on the right that there's much work to be done before Congress actually looks like the rest of the country. I used this data in my custom creative process, which I call data materialization, which involves importing conceptually relevant data from a spreadsheet to processing sketch to generate patterns that begin the designs of my objects and sculptural forms. The data is not meant to be read clearly, but influences the patterns and is deeply important to the narrative of the work. There is quite a bit of tweaking and reworking in my design process in order to get the design produced, though I never edit the scale of the data drawn vectors. However, the connections and intersections often need to be scaled and shifted around in order to have the design be physically produced. The data dots have to be moved to join other parts of the design so as not to drop out of the final cut pattern. There is meaning behind not only the utilized data, but the overall form of the piece. And in the case of my baskets, I'm referencing a comment made by Hillary Clinton in 2016, which seemed to have offended many people. Though it's kind of funny how it doesn't seem that any male politicians can say anything offensive. So I worked with the wonderful support team at the Architectural Fabrication Lab, otherwise known at the ranch out at Rellis campus to water jet cut my patterns in steel. And if you're not familiar with it, water jet cutting is a fun process that involves using an abrasive such as garnet and super high water pressure, maybe something like 30 times more powerful than a pressure washer to cut through nearly any material. As I set out to make this work, I was thinking of my friend and inspiration, North Carolina artist, Elizabeth Brim, a woman holding her own and letting her femininity shine in the very male dominated world of blacksmithing. She fell in love with blacksmithing several decades ago and despite her mother saying it was not a very ladylike thing to do, she counters that by always smithing her iron wearing a strand of pearls. She creates extremely feminine objects as a commentary on the expectations of the women of her generation. And though it had been a while, it felt really good to earn my calluses back this summer. These flat steel cutouts require a forging of sorts to take on the bowl form. I slowly work them into this carved out tree stump, which is not quite as straightforward as it sounds since as you can see, they're not a perfect fit. But I have to admit, it was really therapeutic to make these, and I have several ideas for pieces that will expand this set into a series. So look for more baskets in the future. And here is one of the three baskets on display in the Wright Gallery. And it's quite an honor to be in this exhibition with these amazing women who are my colleagues and also my friends. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Courtney. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions among the participants in the Zoom meeting. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question to any of the artists. Uh, to Courtney, uh, the, um, the material is steel that you're cutting, and is it coated with something after you've done the forging? And the, there seems like there was a color change in there, so I'm wondering, has it been coated? Yes, that's an excellent observation. Um, thanks. Yeah, I actually put um, kind of an oxidation material or solution onto the steel afterwards. It's called gun blue um, and you can <laughs> buy it at Walmart in the gun section. So it actually darkens the steel uh, and then I, I put wax on to kind of seal that mm -hmm. afterwards. And does the bluing work with heat or just room temperature? It works with room temperature. 
So it's kind of, um, you put it on and use steel wool and then like kind of rough it off and then recoat it and rinse and, and rough it off and then kind of build it up. If you build it on too thick, it creates kind of a flaky texture that pops back off. So it's kind of, you wanna oxidize, it's kind of a form of, of oxidizing the steel. Uh -huh. So related to annealing, annealing like with porch? Mm. Well, yeah, you get an oxidation coating when you anneal, but the annealing is basically taking and softening the metal through a heat process, taking it up to a certain temperature, so then it becomes more malleable. So you're kind of realigning a crystalline structure in the metal. Well, I, was, I always thought of it as a color thing. The annealing, but okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, on behalf of the College of Architecture, just wanted to congratulate all women artists that I have presented today. It has been not only inspirational but also very instructional about the process of art creation. I want to also welcome Jane Winslow who is not from the VIS department specifically, and she really contributed from the landscape architecture perspective, which has made this exhibit richer than it, it is already. So thank you very much to all the artists. I think it's especially relevant today when Ruth Bader Ginsburg has a past that we are more aware of the many rights have been so hard for women to achieve, to conquer, and the invisibility of many women, and especially women artists also. So I really wanted to say thank you. And thanks Rebecca, the new curator of the gallery for making sure that this was possible today. So that's, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. I have a question for Mary. Mary, in your work, um, you're, you're speaking about the melting ice and like the kind of environmental changes and in kind of an abstraction. Are you, what are you looking at? What is your source material and do you create collages or do you, what's your process of, of going from a visual to a painting? Well, I have sketchbooks little sketchbooks, and I draw on these. I, I often listen to Rachel Maddow at night and, um, and do sketches while I'm watching. And um, they don't necessarily lead to paintings. And the paintings, I sort of have an idea, and then I just go. I got a projector. I thought I could project stuff and use it, but it's, I did it twice and I hated it. I just go, you know. Um, you know, not quite the same as uh, Joan Mitchell. You know, I don't really just sort of wait after I'm intoxicated and then throw paint. But I just, I just let it happen, and then it takes over. Everything I've ever learned, I it takes over. I try to use um, a balance of gesture and contour, and I try to escape what I've done before, and um, it just evolves. I suppose everybody works that way, but I don't know. Here are some behind me, done at different times, different colors. I'm working more into blue now, now that I accept that my blue world is being destroyed. You know, what with the, what with the air in, in uh, California where my daughter lives and two of my sisters live, and they were getting ready to leave because of the fire approaching and then they couldn't breathe, and then they couldn't use air conditioning because they didn't have it or they didn't dare use it because then there'd be no electricity for everybody to share. So, you know, we're living in tumultuous times, and I think my work is going to become darker and maybe more orange. Thanks for the question. Mary, I just want to let you know that I also use golden artist colors, ah, and that's the paint that I have included on my sculpture. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it is. Can I respond to that? Absolutely. Uh, my sister, decades ago, one of my sisters for Christmas gave me a tube of acrylic paint, red and green. And for a year, I tried to use it. 
and it was like painting with plastic. It was opaque. It was congested. I could, and I never used it again. Golden acrylics were invented after that. We can thank Mr. Golden. <laughs> yes, and such wonderful uh, gels and mediums that make collage work and the mixed media work that I do possible. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any more questions from within the group here on Zoom? Yeah, I have a question for Karen. Um, Karen, I really like your pinhole technique and your stereoscope, and it seems to have kind of a timelessness to it. Can you relate that to what some of the contemporary or things that you photograph and how you relate that? Would that make sense? Well, um, let me just talk about sort of launching into using a pinhole camera first. And we'll see if I can get around to your question. I'm not sure. I <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, I had been doing for a number of years extremely tedious and physically demanding uh, drawings on a light table with a, a pen with a, with, a, with a nib where you dip the nib into the ink, you know, I mean, and um, though I really like that body of work and I still do like it, I, after doing it for a number of years, I, I needed something where I had no control whatsoever and had no idea what was going to happen. And so that's what led me to start doing uh, pinhole work. Well, like all of us artists, we try to understand our materials. So the natural quest is, how do I control these materials now that I have? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm excellent at the exposure. I can't believe how good I am at it. I want to know, the technique seems like something that's timeless, but some oh. of your themes are not. They're more contemporary. So how do you align those, the technique with today? Well, I don't really see that as being uh, a contradiction or at odds. Okay. I mean, it's just, an, it's just a material, just like the, the computer is a material, the paintbrush is a material or a technique. Uh, I don't really have any kind of... Uh, limiting idea of oh it's a pinhole camera and here's when it was first made and let's talk about the camera obscura and you know so there must be certain things that follow from that it's just another tool as far as i'm concerned so i i think you can apply historic processes to anything really and uh it's not necessarily important that they are historic. People you, do Karen. people do talk about that a lot, but yeah. I, I think I think their importance is overrated myself. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Thank you. So we have time for one quick question from Facebook Live, sent by Matthew Hurley. Thank you very much for sending it. This question is for Mary. He says, "I've noticed in your deluge paintings, many of them give me a sensation of an enormous value valley or a cliff. Would you talk some more about the shapes you're inspired by, and if you think any of them as landscapes? Keep them as landscapes. I, uh, when I first started, that they're not visible here." But it was just water, and um, you know, one was called the the rain will never end. Um, and then these forms started to come in. I have lived among mountains. My sister lives north of San Francisco. One of my sisters on a cliff, and uh, the water's beneath, below her. We call it the Bolinas Riviera. And I go there in the summer sometimes and paint. Not a bad life. But, you know, so I'm aware of the hills and the mountains and the destruction. And I've looked at a lot of videos of the destruction of, of the North and South Pole with things crashing into the water. So a lot of that has affected what I'm doing. There is a, a violence underneath all this. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. All right. Um, just as a closing statement for today's virtual artist talks, on behalf of the Wright Gallery and the Curatorial Committee, including Chair Cecilia Giusti and members Stephen Caffey, Felice House, Krista Steinke, and Carrie, Karen Hillier, I would like to thank all participating faculty members for sharing their work 
and Mary G. and James S. Wright for their generous Wright Gallery Endowment. Special thanks to Stephen Caffey for coordinating the exhibition. Thank you all for joining us.